Reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 7 to 10. I'll read the text out loud and you can follow along on the screens. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are in the final week of a sermon series that we have been going through in Advent called Advent Now, the Coming of God is Told by Isaiah. And in this sermon series, we have been uh, tracking the theological trajectory that is laid out in the book of Isaiah and using that as a roadmap for understanding the importance of the Advent season, of the season where we mark God's coming. And obviously, we finally mark the climax of that season on Friday with the uh, celebration of Christmas and the birth of God's son, Jesus of Nazareth. And today, in the first Sunday after Christmas, we'll be bringing that trajectory to a close. We began uh, in, in the end of November, looking uh, first at Isaiah's throne room vision of God and, and the, the, the great gap and distance that existed between God and humans. And then in, in the second week, we saw that God's people, who are supposed to be part of the work of bridging that gap of, of witnessing to the rest of humanity and word and deed about what God is like, that God's people themselves were part of the problem as they were bearing bad fruits. Then in week three, we saw that God's servants was uh, supposed to come. Uh, Isaiah promised that, that an individual would come who would go uh, in the power of God and maybe even the identity of God, and that God's servant would do what God's people were unable to do, that, that he himself would bridge that gap. Uh, and and, and uh, at the same time, restore uh, God's people and heal them from this bad fruit. We then looked uh, um, at uh, the, the preparing of the way and, and seeing God's coming a long way off. And then finally, uh, welcomes the Lord Jesus uh, yesterday on Christmas. And today we're going to bring that trajectory with a close because after God completes his work of coming to us and meeting us, we are then tasked with the work of being sent out by God. To continue to do the work of sharing God's deeds and the good news of God's deeds with others. That is what we'll be looking at today. I've titled today's sermon, Advent Now, with their own eyes. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you in this moment in our scattered togetherness, wherever we are, uh, around the city or even around the country, God. We, we all in our hearts and in the spaces that we inhabit come to you, God, and, and we uh, set ourselves down before you and say, will you come and will you be here? Will you be with us? And will you be God for us and over us? Will you come, Lord, in the name of Jesus? Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, what a joy it has been to mark your coming to us, uh, Emmanuel, God with us, and your son Jesus, and God with the same spirit and power that Jesus had come to us, we want to be sent out in that same spirit and power to help to bring you and bridge the gap between those who might be still far from you. God, will you be stirring us up in this time to equip us for that work? Lord, will you stir me up in this moment to equip me for the work of preaching and teaching your word? We need you, Lord. We ask for these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our text in Isaiah today, 52, verses 7 to 10, uh, begins by laying out a number of realities, a number of deeds that God has accomplished. It names and acknowledges these deeds. There are at least three of them that it names and acknowledges in verses 7 through 9. The first is that God reigns. Israel's God, Yahweh, God, 
reigns. Isaiah 52, 7 says, who say to Zion, your God reigns and rules. And to say that God reigns, to use kingly royal imagery to say that God reigns is to say that other rulers or authorities or powers that would claim to be ruling and reigning have been unseated, they've been exposed, they've been cast down. And instead, Israel's God is sitting on the throne. God reigns. This is to say that God is in charge. And in God's work manifested in Jesus, God has made his claim to being in charge and ruling over the world. He is in charge even in our current experience of times of challenge, of, of, uh, of, of even chaos at times. But God, uh, in saying that God reigns, God is making a claim to be in charge even in times of chaos. We might ask briefly how, how God can be in charge, how God can be ruling even in times when things are chaotic or, or things uh, are, are challenging or when we see evil seeming to win the day, how, how can this be that God is ruling and reigning and yet challenging things and hard things still happen? We looked very briefly on Christmas about the theological framework of the already and the not yet. Uh, uh, grounded in the teachings of Jesus, the New Testament teaches us that God has won and secured certain good things in the work that's been done in Jesus, but that even Jesus said there's now a time sort of in between the times where God has won and secured future realities, but that Jesus still has yet to return and consummate all of those things and really uh, um, make God's authority all in all. And so we, we looked at this briefly on Christmas, this idea of, of some of God's victory being already and some of it being not yet. I want to come back to that language just briefly and point out that it's very important that we understand that that language is already and not yet and not already and not. It's already and not yet. In other words, because of God's victory in Jesus and what God has accomplished in Jesus, how God has returned to his people and to humanity in Jesus, God has secured certain things already and certain things that will be in the future. And so we call them not yet. And that word yet is very important because there's nothing that God has promised, no good thing that God has promised that will not ultimately be brought to full and final fulfillment by Jesus. And so we can even see now and affirm now that when we say that God is in charge and God is ruling, even over present times of chaos or challenge or trouble, or even, like I said, when it seems that evil is winning the day, we know that to say that God is in charge and God is ruling is to say that God has shown in Jesus that God is able to accomplish his purposes no matter what is going on in the present. That God really can work all things to the fulfillment of the things that he has purposed them for. And in that, even when we experience present challenge and tumult, we know that God is in charge. God is able to bring his good purposes out of any circumstances. And that has been demonstrated in and through Jesus. And so we say, God reigns. God reigns. That's the first reality, God reigns. The second reality is that God has returned. God returns. This is uh, verse 8 of chapter 52. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. God returns. God reigns and God has returned to his people. The human divine separation that we've been tracking all the way through the sermon series in various places in the text of the book of Isaiah, this divine human separation has been ended in God's return. And we saw this embodied even in the name of this promised child whose, uh, whose birth we, we marked and celebrated on Christmas that God said in the book of Isaiah, his name was to be Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel, literally with us God, Emmanuel, with us God, that this human divine separation has been ended in Emmanuel, God with us. God has returned to his people. And in this, we know now and experience that God is not far off. God's closeness is here and present to us in Jesus. We can be close to Jesus when we read about him in the Gospels, when we encounter his words, when we even encounter people who encounter Jesus. We can see ourselves in their experience and their reactions. We can encounter Jesus in the scriptures. We can encounter Jesus in the spirit and in, in the spiritual realm when we 
pray and worship and meditate in that place where, where there's something about our existence where the sum of, of that reality is more than, than the addition of, of the parts of our existence. In that place, that spiritual place, we come to Jesus and we meet him because he says he is alive. He's ruling now at the right hand of the Father and his spirit is with us. We can meet Jesus and God is close to us in scripture and in spirits. And he's also maybe particularly close to us in the facts that God came as Jesus. This particular person who was low socially and down and out and downcast in many ways, that, that as God identifies himself with the lowly and the suffering, the battered, the hurt, that God comes to us in our own times of of pain and challenge. And so God is close to us in Jesus because Jesus allowed himself to live this lowly life. So in the scriptures and in the spirits and in Jesus' own experience, the lived particulars of his life, God is close to us. God has returned to his people in Jesus and he is not far off. The third reality, God redeems. God rules, God returns. God redeems. This is in verse 9 of chapter 52. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. He has redeemed. This word redeemed is a technical word. It's an important word, and we need to recognize the context. There's a Levitical context here in chapter 25, verses 23 to 28 of the book of Leviticus. I think I've got the text up here for you on the screen. There it is. Uh, I'm going to read this text out loud again. This is from the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verses 23 to 28. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine, says the Lord, and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Throughout the land that you hold as a possession, you must provide for the redemption of the land. For if one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. If, however, there is no one to redeem it for them, but later on they prosper and acquire sufficient means to redeem it for themselves, they are to determine the value for the year since they sold it and refund the balance to the ones to whom they sold it. They can, go, they can then go back to their own property. But if they do not acquire the means to repay, what was sold will remain in the possession of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. It will be returned in the Jubilee, and they can then go back to their property. In ancient Israel, God's people were, their identity as God's people was tied to the allotments of the promised land that they were given the land, that they were given when they entered into the land in the book of Joshua. And so uh, for, for part of, of uh, ancient Israel, a family or a clan and a tribe, for them to lose for some reason through economic hardship or punishment, for them to lose their land would have been a loss of their identity, a loss of their value and self-worth, the loss of their place of belonging as a member of God's people. It would have been a devastating loss. But of course, in the realities of this fallen world, some people have economic flourishing while others have economic hardship. And so this passage in Leviticus imagines what would happen if someone through economic hardship lost control of the land that they had been given. And there are two provisions in this passage that, that provide for the redemption of that land for the family so that their identity would not be broken and cast aside. The first is in the redeeming of the land through the payment of money. And of course, it's implicit in the text, but the buyer of the land had to receive the redemption payment. They were not able to keep the land and accumulate it for themselves. They had to receive the redemption payment and give the land back to its rightful owners. Additionally, if the family was never able to acquire the money or the financial means to get their land back, every 50 years in the Jubilee year, the debts were just paid anyways. They, they were, uh, paid is the wrong word. They were canceled. The debts were just removed and canceled, and the land was given back to their people. And so their identity, their worth, and their belonging in God's family were redeemed to them. The same tactical meaning of the word redeemed is present here in Isaiah 52.9. He has redeemed Jerusalem. God has redeemed his people. He, he has bought them back 
not only from, from a disconnection uh, from their home and from their identity that we would see in the Levitical context, but the New Testament says they've been redeemed from sin, from oppression, from even death and from the devil, from these forces that, that uh, beyond and in addition to economic forces or social forces that, that become spiritual forces that assault the very being the very being, the very integrity of your fabric as a human, they, they, they assault your being before God. And God says, I have redeemed you from these things in Jesus. An important thing to recognize as a result of this, of course, is that if God has redeemed you from sin, from oppression, from death, from the devil, if God has redeemed you from these things, then no one has a more costly claim on your life than God in Jesus. Nothing could make a more weighty, more valuable, more costly claim over your life, your identity, your worth, your value. No success that you've had, no failure that you've had, no joy, no tragedy, no, no accusation or, or shame or guilt could possibly weigh upon you a costlier claim to your life than God who laid upon you the life of his son Jesus and who bought you back, who redeems you. God in Jesus has laid the most costly claim on your life that could be made. So these realities, these three realities are laid out in Isaiah 52. God reigns, God returns, and God redeems. But in the context of Isaiah 52, not only are these realities laid out, they're laid out in the context of unfolding different ways that people respond to these realities different ways that people respond to and experience these realities. And we're going to look at three models that are laid out for our own response to these realities in this text. There are three models laid out, the herald, the watchman, and the reveler. The first is the herald. We see the herald show up in verse seven. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. The herald has a ministry and an experience of proclamation. The feet of the herald go from the place of receiving information or experiencing this reality to some public place to proclaim and announce that reality to others. And so the herald brings good news, good news of peace, of good tidings, and of salvation. The herald as a model for witness then is a model of conversational witness. It's a model that, that, it's a model that implies the question, have you heard? The implicit question for the herald is always, have you heard the news that I have for you? The herald then has, has a witness of interest and inquiry. Those who feel close to the model of the herald are people who are asking questions about the lives of others. They're, they're paying attention to what other people are saying and thinking about. They're, they're empathetically awake to the challenges that other people are going through. And all the way along, they're thinking, have you heard? Have you heard about what God has accomplished in Jesus? That might have something to say to what you're thinking about right here or what you're experiencing right here or the tragedy that you're going through. The Herald has a ministry of interest and inquiry into the lives of others, and then the proclaiming of good news. There is an anti-form, an anti-type to each of the types that we're going to look at. The anti-type to the herald is the moralist. Instead of proclaiming good news, the moralist has an experience of the same sort of verbal life, maybe has a platform, but the moralist, instead of proclaiming the good news of God to people, burdens people with shoulds. The moralist just says, you should do this, you should do this. The good news are all the things that you should be doing, but that you're not. Instead of proclaiming good news, the moralist verbally burdens with shoulds. The herald versus the moralist. The second type that we see here is the watchman. The watchman stands upon the wall. This is Isaiah 52, verse 8. Listen, your watchman lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. The watchmen are up at night. They're up at night and they're looking when no one else is looking. Their eyes and attention are focused with laser precision upon a particular place. Their senses are alert. 
And so the watchman, whereas the herald has a conversational witness, the watchman has a performative witness, the witness of performing the act of seeing clearly. Where the herald has a witness of interest and inquiry, the watchman has a witness of time and attention. The watchman looks and gives focused time and attention to the Lord, to the things that the Lord embodies, to the, to the high ideals of pursuing the love and the goodness and the holiness of God. And as the watchman looks with focus, time and attention at these things, people then see the watchman and then their gaze is directed out to the things that the watchmen are looking at. The watchman has a witness of time and attention. And when people come into relationship with a watchman, they implicitly begin to see and to look at the things that a watchman is looking at. Whereas the moralist is the anti-type to the herald, the viewer, the, say, casual viewer, the distracted viewer is the anti-type to the watchman. The viewer simply engages in a passive consumption or a distracted consumption versus a focused time and attention of looking for and looking at. And as a result, the viewer who is so distracted by the number of different things that, that they are consuming and the number of different focuses of their attention are not able to witness to any one thing. A watchman, the herald, and then the third type is the reveler. The reveler sings and celebrates. This is 52 verse 9. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. The Lord has comforted his people. The reveler responds and witnesses to the good deeds of God by rejoicing, by celebrating. This isn't just an excess, and it certainly isn't a, a waste of time. Sometimes when we think of doing things for God. We, we think through lenses of productivity and, and, and using my gifts and talents, and there, there's a, a utility there. The reveler just witnesses to the joy of God by being caught up in the celebration of the joy of God's good news. There's no extra utility there. It just is a witness on its own to invite people into the joy of celebration. The reveler then has songs of joy to sing. The reveler restores ruins and invites ruined, ruined lives, ruined situations to enter into the joy of celebration and revelry. This is an invitational witness. It's an invitational witness. The reveler, the reveler has a witness of join us, join us. And in this invitation and overflow, there is a witnessing to the good deeds of God. The anti-type or the anti-form for the reveler is the royster. <laughs> a royster means uh, is one who celebrates to excess. And uh, I, <laughs> my wife and I have a joke about royster. And uh, it's just I'm totally throwing this in there for her because uh, she's just a <laughs> delight. Um, so the anti-type for the reveler is the royster, the one who celebrates to excess. Uh, whereas the, 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 the reveler has a, a, a focused external mark for their experience of celebration and joy, uh, the royster celebrates to excess, perhaps unto uh, gluttony or, or a sort of binging, and, and perhaps most importantly, maybe a turned inward view of celebration, a celebration that, that once it becomes and rolls into excess, becomes turned into oneself. Rather, the uh, externally focused joy and revelry that comes from keeping the good deeds of God and their accomplishment in Jesus at the center of our celebration. Which form are you, the herald, the watchman, or the reveler? Maybe you heard one of those and thought, gosh, that feels close to me. I, I have a ministry of words. And, and platforms, and I, 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 I feel close to the model of the herald to proclaiming the good news and stating in, in, in nuanced and culturally appropriate ways the good news of God. Maybe you feel like I, I felt close and called to a ministry of time and attention. I can focus and give my, my undivided, integrated self to the ministry of paying attention and looking for 
the good deeds of God. And that as I do that, people become caught up in my own gaze towards God and they can see God a little better as well. Or maybe you felt like I feel close to the joy and the play and the delight of reveling and celebrating in the good news of God. Each week in the sermon series, we've taken just a little bit of time uh, because our host, John Kim, our vineyard pastors, in the, uh, our host for the in-person part of the service, uh, uh, their vineyard pastors here in the city. And so we've taken just a little bit of time to learn about values of the vineyard uh, movement of churches. One of them is to pursue culturally relevant mission to the world, to pursue culturally relevant mission to the world. The words culturally relevant are important here because the, the forms and the language and the tone and the approach of sharing the gospel differs from culture to culture and context to context. Uh, and and, and in, in that spirit, the spirit of culturally relevant ministry, we need, we need each of the forms that we've looked at here, the, the herald, the watchman, the reveler. We need each of them to help round out what it could look like to pursue culturally relevant mission in our own context. The second key word I want to pull out here, aside from culturally relevance, of course, is mission. And that language there helps us to stay anchored in the mission and the action and the words and works of God. It's not just any mission. As sometimes we can lose the plot and get caught up in our own missions or our culture's missions or our society's missions or, or even in, 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 in the in the, the missions of one person and, 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 uh, and one pastor's mission, um, we want to stay uh, 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 clearly grasping God's mission. Uh, and so these, these lang this language of culturally relevant set aside mission are important to, to think about the ways in which mission does need to uh, change uh, form and shape and tone and language to, to be well-rooted and planted in a particular context. Context, and at the same time, to clearly hold on to God's own mission that ultimately was made flesh in Jesus. So the text begins by acknowledging God's deeds, uh, these three realities. God reigns, God returns, God redeems, and then looks at different models for sharing the experience of God's deeds. The herald, the watchman, the reveler. All of this is done in the pursuit of ourselves and others being made able to see God's deeds. The point is to be able to see God's deeds. Isaiah 52 verse 10 says, The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see. It will see the salvation of our God. And this verse here just follows out the same trajectory that unfolds, folds out the same trajectory that we've been walking through. God's holy arm, his mighty actions have been revealed, his power, they've been revealed in what? In the sight of all the nations. It, this is a public image. God's actions have taken place on a public stage so that all might see the salvation of our God. There's a wonderful story at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke of someone seeing the salvation of their God. And I'd like to look at it with you. It's in Luke chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. This is the story of Simeon. Simeon took Jesus, the baby Jesus, in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servants in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Simeon was a righteous man who lived in Jerusalem and had been waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And when Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to the temple to dedicate him, Simeon held him in his arms and said, my eyes have seen the salvation. Of the Lord. Notice how Simeon's text follows so closely the text of Isaiah. His eyes have seen God's salvation. They beheld God's salvation. And, and among what? Um, uh, uh, in, in what context has Simeon seen this? It says, 
the, the, the salvation which you have pre prepared in the sight of the nations in verse 31 of Luke chapter 2. This public preparing and demonstration of what? This revelation and glory, God's holy truth. And as a result, Simeon says, God, you may dismiss your servant. Because for everyone, the ultimate satisfaction and the laying down of all the agendas and all the things that we felt like we needed and were grasping onto, we get the strength and the power and the satisfaction to lay them down by beholding God's salvation. This is the ultimate satisfaction. And here at the end of the trajectory of this Advent series, this is the role that we are called into as we receive God's being with us in Jesus, Emmanuel, we are sent out to turn around and help other people see with their own eyes. To help others see with their own eyes the salvation of our God. Which role do you feel closely um, uh, connected to of the herald, the watchman, or the reveler when you think about helping people to see with their own eyes? And maybe, honestly, you, you know that you connected to one of the roles because you particularly connected with one of the anti-forms or the anti-types, uh, the sort of uh, um, the moralist or the viewer or the royster. Uh, if, if that is you, if you felt like, oh gosh, I know which one I am because I connected to the anti-type, um, grace to you. It, God is able mercifully and uh, gently to... Uh, take those ways uh, in which we are maybe bent slightly out of shape and to bring them into alignment um, uh, with something that he can use for his good purposes. And God is always gentle in his correction of that. Of the uh, final phrase that I've created here, I want to draw particular attention to the line with their own eyes their own eyes. We, we ultimately are trying to help people see with their own eyes God's salvation. Sometimes we fall into the mistake of having seen Jesus so clearly in our own lives that we just try to share with people what we have seen, with what, what was meaningful to us or what spoke to us. And of course, those are good and valuable things and, and part of of, of any uh, faithful, meaningful witnessing to God's deeds to other people. But ultimately, we're not trying to get people to see exactly what we saw in terms of what our experience was. We're trying to create situations where people are able to see in ways that are meaningful to them God's own salvation. This means that we hold with the utmost uh, sanctity and care the questions and experiences and challenges and hopes and joys of other people and let those things set the table for the conversation uh, or, 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 or the, the performative witness or the celebration that we ultimately invite people into when we share Jesus with them. Because we're trying to lead people and, and, and partner with God to witness to people in a way that is speaking to other people in their own experiences, their own questions, their own challenges, that they might behold Jesus with their own eyes and not with ours. Finally, we remember and hold tightly uh, to the reality that Jesus is the object of this sight. Uh, not even ourselves or, or not even church, but Jesus, that people might see him clearly and as a result, see the saving actions of God. This really is uh, the sort of um, what the, the, the door of Advent, it, it swings open one way into the welcome of God and swings back out the other way as we go out from our experience of having met God to help other people meet God as well. God's coming to us results in our being sent out. Let's go from here into 2021 in the spirit of being sent, having experienced clearly God's coming to us, let us go and help others experience God clearly as well.